Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on energy benchmarking for municipal facilities. This is the third webinar in a series just launched called the Clean Energy and Energy Management Webinar Series. This series is a collaboration between the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, EGLE, and the University of Michigan. I'm Leah Edelman, a student at the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy, and I work on helping to manage this webinar series and a range of activities with EGLE. For today's webinar, you will take any questions via the questions feature on the GoToWebinar console. As you can see on the screen, it's toward the bottom of that console that should be on the right side of your screen. We encourage you to submit your questions as they occur to you throughout the speaker's presentations by entering them into the questions field on the webinar console. Our moderator, Sarah Mills, will pose the questions to the panelists. When you submit a question, it's only visible to the organizers, so don't panic if you don't see any questions. And now I'll turn it over to Sarah to introduce the panel and the format. Thank you, Leah. Um, I'm Sarah Mills. I'm a researcher at the University of Michigan, and I manage our collaboration with EGLE. This webinar series is just one part of a bigger project that we have to help local governments across the state set policies and develop programs related to clean energy. And really the, the rationale behind this series is to highlight the work that communities in Michigan are already undertaking with respect to energy efficiency and renewable energy and to try to demystify it a bit for other um, Michigan local governments. It's our goal to highlight that these actions are possible and are already happening in communities big and small um, from Southeast Michigan to the UP. So I am delighted today to have with me April Levine, who's the energy coordinator for Washtenaw County and Bob Lefebvre, the manager in the village of uh, Lantz. Our format for the webinar today is a little different from the previous webinars that we've had in this series. I've asked each of the panelists to first tell you a bit about their community and what they've done on energy benchmarking. And then we'll transition to more of a conversation with me asking them questions about their experiences and tips that they wanna share with you so that you can really understand where to start, what challenges you might occur and how you can overcome those challenges. So if you have any questions that you'd like me to pose to them, um, please feel free to submit them as they come to you and I'll work them into the conversation. At the very end of the panel today, you'll also hear from Julie Staveland, um, the acting manager of Eagle's sustainability section to tell you more about a funding program that's set to launch next week for communities that are ready to start benchmarking or making other clean energy improvements to their facilities. So let's get to it. Um, first up is April, um, who I think wanted to start out her introduction to Washtenaw County with a couple of slides. So April, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on benchmarking. I'm excited to share with you what Washtenaw County has done with our energy program and how benchmarking is essential to strategic energy management. Washtenaw County provides multiple services for our 344,791 citizens living within a 723 square mile area. My department manages the infrastructure in which these services take place. And just like any other government organization, it is our corporate social responsibility to ensure these facilities are operating as energy efficient and environmentally friendly as possible. In April of 2012, I was hired as the county's energy coordinator. My main objective is to reduce the negative impact of doing business. This includes energy, water, materials and resources, waste, fleet, recycling, stormwater policy, and building operations. One of my first tasks was to identify how much energy and water our buildings use and where those energy sources come from so I can track carbon. So I located and identified every meter that served each of my buildings. I have 107 meters total, just in case you were wondering. The next step was to identify the utility accounts associated with each of these buildings and meters to ensure that they were all correct. And we did find a few meters that were not correctly identified. Next slide, please. 
And then came the tedious part, recording the data from each meter. This information comes directly from your utility bill. If you don't have past bills, contact your utility representative and ask for past bills, copies, or reports. Don't be shy to call your utility provider and ask questions about light items on your bill that you may not understand. I have seven different water providers and they all bill differently. It's amazing what you can learn when you call your utility provider and start asking questions. You can also find valuable utility information at the Michigan Public Service Commission website. So once I had the data and I knew what I wanted to benchmark, I needed a way to quickly be able to identify utility anomalies, track results of energy projects, efficiency initiatives, and monitor utility costs. So I created my own spreadsheet. As you can see, a small sample is on this slide. I also keep notes of any changes in building use, hours of operations, or special initiatives which help explain or identify increases or decreases in energy use or cost. Once I found a utility bill error that resulted in a refund check of $131,000, I compared two similar properties that were in my portfolio. The cost difference was enough to make me dig just a little bit deeper. So the result, this resulted in a heavy, hefty refund along with a reduced annual bill. Next slide, please. And it's also exciting to showcase the results of your energy program. Elected officials, building occupants, citizens and taxpayers all appreciate being informed on what environmental efforts are being done in tax funded facilities. So for example, my energy program has reduced our overall electrical cost by 42% or $415,948. And it's also reduced our carbon footprint by 21% or 4,131,350 pounds. My organization is very data-driven. Having this information readily available shows how dedicated we are to sustainable facility management. I am able to demonstrate the impact of energy projects have had, which are highlighted in green. This valuable information helps facilitate those discussions of funding additional energy or sustainability projects like solar. Next slide, please. So I also have my utility data entered in Energy Star's Portfolio Manager. This free and easy to use online tool can help you compare how efficient your building performs to similar buildings. It provides a building rating of one to 100. 100 meaning your building performs the best and one meaning you got a lot of work to do. In 2015, we renovated our Learning Resource Center. We, in, we installed all new LED lighting with advanced controls, new audio video equipment, new windows, upgraded insulation, and an all electric HVAC system. My team did such a phenomenal job reno renovating this building that the use more than doubled. So even though the use increased and the hours of operation almost doubled, the energy was reduced by 50%. So this is great, right? So if that's the case, then why did my facility go from an Energy Star rating of 76 to a 40? So what didn't change was the carbon footprints. Our effort made no reduction on the carbon footprint at this facility. Now, if we had used a traditional natural gas HVAC system, we would have, reduced, we would have received a higher Energy Star rating, but we'd still be using fossil fuels. We do have a plan to install a solar array at this site that will make this facility Washtenaw County's first net zero building. Since we know what the energy use is for this all electric facility, we will be able to appropriately determine the size of the solar array. The benchmarking shows us when we are on the right track, but it also paints a very clear picture of where we need improvement. The Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners voted unanimously to endorse a climate emergency declaration the board set a goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2035. Then the board changed the goal from 2035 to 2030. So as a facility manager, if your organization announced a similar goal, would you be able to tell them how much carbon your, op your operations would have to shed to become net zero or carbon neutral? Without basic baseline information, how would you plan to meet that goal and what resources would be required to achieve it? Next slide, please. Benchmarking can also help you catch utility billing errors. 
for example, this is a gas bill that I received that is not correct. It was fairly easy to dispute this particular bill, but I was able to show 10 years of gas use in history to show that this bill is incorrect. The final product of collecting, uh, next slide please. So the final product of collecting all this crazy amount of data can be seen in the Washtenaw County Annual Portfolio. This comprehensive portfolio is presented to our Board of Commissioners to showcase our team's commitment to sustainability. It's made available to the public as a guide to our buildings, services, and our impact on the environment. The link to our portfolio is on this slide. I hope I've been able to convey today how important it is to benchmark your facilities. At the end of the day, the effort will be worth your reward. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, April. I do have a bunch of questions and I'm sure the audience does too. Just a reminder to the audience, if you do have any questions that come to mind throughout here, feel free to um, post them and we'll work them into the conversation. Um, but first, let's hear from Bob, um, as I think I think it'll be helpful to do some compare and contrast. Um, Bob Lefebvre, as I mentioned before, is the manager in the village of Lance, which it should be noted, has its own municipal electric utility. And so um, I'm gonna turn off the slides for now so that you can see better see Bob and understand kind of how that might play into what he's doing. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, as uh, Sarah said, I'm the village manager here in Lots, Michigan. I've been here for a little over 12 years now. Uh, we're a full service community uh, as far as a governmental organization, and we also have to run a municipal electric utility. Uh, the community is about 2,000 people. And, um, you know, we've gotten involved in quite a few different things. One of the, the biggest ways that we kind of began looking at um, how we could deal with some of the challenges we're facing was doing benchmarking and, and getting into some energy audits in our own facilities to see where there were opportunities for us to uh, do something about our own costs. And it, obviously, uh, if there was energy efficiencies that we could gain in our buildings, which there's a lot of literature that said that that was possible, um, it could help us drive back uh, dollars that you know, we've been missing in things like revenue sharing from the state and push that back out back into the community and help us uh, maintain and enhance our services to our own community. So it started out, we, we took a look at our, our water and wastewater facilities. Um, we were able to identify some opportunities there, whether that was um, uh, doing uh, LED lighting of all of our facilities, which also have led into other things like our street lighting initiatives and, and other things, uh, as well as opportunities where we could plug in renewables into some of our, our uh, uh, facilities and into our community as well. So, I mean, at our water treatment uh, facility, for example, which pulls water into our community directly from Lake Superior, uh, we have uh, a pilot project we did there with a solar array, uh, helped drive down our energy costs at that facility. Um, also gave us an opportunity to, to do some more benchmarking to show that the technology works here in the Upper Peninsula and help drive into some larger community conversations uh, about further renewable adoption. So we actually are one of only three communities in the UP with a community solar array project. Um, uh, it's a 111 kW system uh, up in a, a, our new industrial park that we have in the community and uh, 340 panels and all of them are subscribed to members of our community so they can help save money on their own bills at their own homes. Uh, but also because we are the electric utility, you know, we have access to all of our information. So we've been able to figure out um, where those opportunities are. We've partnered with uh, uh, Whoopeter, which is our local planning region uh, out, of, out of Houghton and actually created, and actually was talking about the planning commission the other night, um, our own community energy management plan. So um, we've uh, done benchmarking on all of our facilities from our ice rink, where we've done LED upgrades, um, condenser upgrades, um, uh, to uh, like our wastewater facility um, and our water facilities to even like our police station and our fire station and the village offices here the uh, where the police department is and then our, our fire department offices are in a building built in 1937 so there was quite a few opportunities there and we've been working on those and it, it gets kind of back to some of the basic fundamentals of management too if you're not measuring it it doesn't matter so giving ourselves an opportunity to take a look at what we had out there has helped us create a roadmap that's helped us make improvements and also 
um, build in some really interesting opportunities where we've been able to engage with our community um, to help bring some renewables into the mix too to help us um, add some extra environmental benefits and um, uh, help the community get involved in a more broader way into um, the work we're doing here in the community. So uh, certainly having uh, the having a municipal electric utility has uh, given us some advantages because we uh, we control that. Um, I like to tell uh, tell people that uh, our customers aren't really our customers, they're our residents, and therefore they're the shareholders in the utility. So we're always looking to find opportunities where we can help drive back that value proposition right back to them because they are the dividend holders for for the utilities. So, but um, it's kind of a short introduction or speech about what we we're doing here in Lots, but we've done quite a few things from, like I said, uh, our LED lighting initiative to, for our street lighting to um, driving into to some of the, the deeper dives into uh, energy efficiency in our municipal buildings, uh, where we've been able to do some things to, to help drive back um, some of the dollars back into our community and our services. So, it's a kind of a little short introduction, but hopefully I'll be able to answer some questions and get into some other things that we're doing here at the community level as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, April, if you want to turn your camera back on, um, I think I have, I'm not someone who has done energy benchmarking. So maybe my, my questions are going to be really introductory <laughs> for the people who are just starting out. Um, what I heard is that, first of all, this isn't like a one-time thing, right? Like it's helpful. The, the purpose of energy benchmarking is both helpful to figure out, to get started, but it's something that continues on. Can you talk, either of you talk a little bit more about that and how, you know, when you started effectively benchmarking and, and you know, the, how it's carried through or how it's expanded? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's funny that, uh, that you mentioned that because even after uh, the almost nine years that I've been benchmarking our buildings for the county, I still find some surprises in there. Uh, it is ongoing. Like I mentioned, uh, I have 107 meters that I track every month and I'm entering this valuable information into a spreadsheet. Uh, if we have some form of anomaly, especially if you have a spike in water use and you can't really determine what that is, uh, if you don't have a building automation system that's alerting you of these spikes in either energy or water, you're going to find yourself spending a lot of additional money. So it's worth it to fund a position such as an energy coordinator to monitor and manage this if you have significant amount of infrastructure. Yeah, and keeping track too, of it uh, over time is is a is a is a challenge when you've got so many meters. Bob, go ahead. I was going to say for us too. I mean, um, even when we've done projects. You have an idea on the forecast of that, what you think you should be able to achieve, but sometimes it also gets back to behaviors that are going on within those facilities as well. So by monitoring that, um, we can find out if somebody's doing something different um, and maybe that thing isn't such a good thing, or maybe we need to um, <laughs> we need to um, get in there and have some conversations and figure out what we're doing wrong so we can achieve what we should be able to achieve. Um, so it's really an ongoing process. It's not just, um, putting together a one-time plan and and uh, doing a project and say nailed it, you know it's it's more than that. So April mentioned you've got 24 different facilities. Bob, how many how many municipal facilities are there in Lots? Do you know? So really, yeah, really we we're we've done most of our work like on six different facilities. We've got the DPW facility, our water, our wastewater plant. We've got. Um, uh, the village office itself, the fire hall, and um, the police station. So we, we really have done a lot of our work kind of focused on that. And then of course, within those facilities too, there's some ancillary facilities that are tied to them that we keep an eye on as well. So um, it, it can be something that's done on a smaller scale with those facilities, but also we've done other work because of because we are the, the electric utility too, out there working with some of our residents and, and, and businesses in our community too, to help them take advantage of um, uh, energy efficiency projects where we can partner with them um, and uh, and try to help them meet some of their goals, um, whether that's doing a home energy audit um, or, or get, getting them in touch with somebody that can help them out with um, uh, something a little larger maybe for an industrial customer. Got it. Um, 
Can you talk just briefly, because this is something that's unique to you, about have you done any benchmarking for your customers outside of municipal facilities? I know that's the focus here, but I, um, as the utility, is it is that something that you've undertaken or are considering undertaking helping residents with? So we've been willing to try to help people with that. Um, like I said, part of it is um, we're trying we, we're trying to drive value back to our community members. So we want we want to help them succeed. So um uh you know whether that's working with um uh uh staff we have here um or our willingness to also um uh, engage uh we're, we're a member of a, a little bit larger uh, organization wppi so that's a bunch of other municipal electric utilities so we have some joint action work we do together so um we can help bring people into the community that can also help out those folks too maybe if they've got a uh, an energy project they're taking on and, and trying to make sure that they're able to find ways to get to those benchmarks that they're looking at. And, and of course, since we have the data, we're happy to share that back with our customers and, and try to help them uh, uh, achieve their goals. Got it. Both of you addressed this a little bit, but just so we can be maybe compare and contrast or be more explicit to people who are just starting, what are the tools that you need to start this out? April mentioned Excel. <laughs> And you need access to your utility bill, right? You need to know the yeah. meetings effectively. But what else? What what else do people need, or is that it? Uh, well, kind of as I had mentioned before, uh, a meter audit is is vital when you're going through and benchmarking your facilities. Uh, we found a water meter that was being billed to the incorrect address, and it was being benchmarked underneath the incorrect facility. So we were able to correct that information because uh, the facility in which that water meter was inappropriately applied didn't make sense for how much water the building was using based on past experiences, how many people, the size of the building. Uh, so I think that's uh, one of the things that you definitely need to do. Identify those meters, the meter numbers, make sure that they are um, in your building and that they maybe don't belong to another building somewhere else. Uh, that actually uh, happened to my parents in a residential setting. They did everything that they could. It was a brand new facility and they did everything they could to reduce their energy use and their bill kept going up. Uh, so my, my dad called me and he said, well, we don't understand. We're doing everything that we're supposed to do. We're turning things off. Everything's unplugged, but yet our bill keeps going up. And I said, well, what's happening with your use? He said, yeah, our use is going up. And I said, well, do you know where your meters are? And he said, yeah. I said, shut the power off to your to your unit and go out and see if your meter's still spinning because back in the day they had those little disks that would spin. And he shut that power off and sure enough, uh, his meter kept spinning, but the neighbor's meter stopped. So what had happened is a utility bill had inadvertently confused those two building addresses with those meters. So the lady next door thought she was getting this great deal because she could turn up her air conditioning and her, her utility was really low. Uh, so they were able to correct that. So uh, it can happen in commercial facilities, it can happen in residential facilities, people make mistakes uh, to errors human, uh, but to go back and double check to make sure that you are being charged for what you're being used is probably one of the most important steps that I think a lot of people miss. And one like of those said, tools is actually getting out there and maybe <laughs> observing that. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, Bob. And once you locate those meters as well, sorry, Bob, but once you locate those meters as well, if you get a utility invoice that looks like that meter rate is like way higher than what it should be, you can utilize that utility bill, go back and actually locate that meter. You know exactly where that meter is and be able to compare that meter rate to the bill to ensure that you're being billed appropriately. Absolutely. And like it, it kind of gets back to that, that what I was saying earlier. It's one of those like maxims of management. It's like if you don't if you're not measuring it, it doesn't matter. You need to pay attention to these things and, and dig into them um, and having access to that, that good quality information. It, it'll allow you to start building, building that benchmark and having an idea of where your opportunities are. Mm -hmm. Earlier, April mentioned the um, she uses a portfolio manager or has used portfolio manager. Can is that something that you've used in Lance, Bob? Um, no, we really have a bunch for us. Really, we, we've built a lot of spreadsheets. We also have a, a really good um, utility billing system that allows us to do some measuring um, and even graphing out of 
uh, utility usage as well. But part of it, it started with actually with the spreadsheets and let's just get into this and you know figure out what's going on out there. Um, and a lot of times, and, and it's it's a, a normal thing, but I think that uh, people over, for a period of time they just assume that some of the things were just the cost of doing business and hadn't really gotten into the the, the nitty gritty of exactly what's going on there. And like I said, some of it is behavioral too. You can get into a facility and maybe um, you've like we have um, a hockey association that kind of helps run our rink. Well, um, how close are people watching what people are doing in there? Are they leaving things on, or are we have people that are going into locker rooms and cranking them up to uh, 90 degrees and leaving them there? I mean, we had to go through and put some locks on some things and and take away some opportunities for people to just to mess around with some of our controls inside of the building because um, they weren't thinking about the fact that there's a bill associated with this and this is affecting the bottom line for the facility and um, there really was no really good reason to turn out a hockey locker room into a sauna and leave it like that for like a day or so. <laughs> <laughs> it helps you identify that but so what I hear is you don't have to use portfolio manager as benchmarking but this is something that you have used April so you want to talk about for people who aren't familiar with it maybe just give a little bit more about what it is and you know, you you mentioned that it measures some things, but maybe that's not your overall goal. So can you can you give a little bit more of an introduction to it? Um, yeah, so portfolio manager is great in the sense that it can compare your building to another similar building in the area, similar number of people, similar size, and then it gives you that energy rating. Um, so we use it for just a, a basic benchmark against other buildings, uh, but the system that I've put in place, I am benchmarking my building year over year against itself. So that's giving me the information that I need. Um, one of the things that we haven't figured out yet um, is how to, uh, for our particular elect all electric facility, how do we normalize for weather when you're using all electric? I'm not sure if the program has a way to do that or not. Um, Unfortunately, I am an army of one person. So uh, the data that I am entering and the data that I do decide to benchmark is I just continue to make sure that my spreadsheets are updated. So sometimes we don't always get this kind of double duty to go back into Portfolio Manager. Uh, so what we do is we utilize interns to enter that information uh, to continue with that work. So uh, when we do see a building that all of a sudden falls from an over 70% down to under 50% on benchmarking with portfolio manager, we know we need to do something differently. Very good. Well, and I want to I wanna just affirm that maybe, Bob, you can affirm this too. You're not the only person who has an army of one focusing <laughs> no, on energy. True. That's true. <laughs> uh, the, the village office here where we're running we have basically we have four utility services that we provide here. Um, it's me and my clerk and my treasurer. Um, as far as the office staff, we have people people who out, go out in the field and work on these things. But it's it's not like we've got like 50 people working here on this. So so that's just to to say to people who are watching this, it's okay. Like you can do it even with a tiny staff. Um, uh, and um, yeah. I am. I, we do have a couple questions that have come in, and one is for both of you about quantifying kind of what your how much your energy reductions have occurred. Um, April, you mentioned it briefly, but can you remind us? And Bob, the question to you is like, have you quantified how what your energy reduction has been since starting benchmarking? Well, I can speak to one facility, like right off the top of my head. So. The ice rink, when I first got here, um, we don't run it year round, but while we have ice, it was costing us consistently in utility bills about $35,000 a year. And when we first tried to do a project to do something about costs there, um, we did a, some lighting work, um, it was pre-LED and um, condenser upgrade. And it seemed like our utility bills really weren't going down. And so, and we really we really started digging into that and a lot of it came down to behavioral things so once we kind of got into that and started engaging more with um the hockey association and the staff people that are down there 
we were able to get that cost down to $23,000 a year in costs. So that right there shows kind of what's possible, but a lot of it gets into digging into what's going on there. Because like I said, you can do energy efficiency projects, but if people aren't doing the right things behaviorally inside the building, you could still keep costs up pretty high. Um, you've got to get people to take a look at what's going on there. And that's part of that monitoring piece. And that's just one facility, for example. So um, I know that like uh, with uh, some of the LED upgrades and um, our solar array we have at our water plant, you know, we've been able to drive down costs there um, year over year to about the tune of about $10,000. So that's, that's been great for us because that's $10,000 if you haven't had rate pressure on our rate pairs for water. So that's been a good thing for us. So um, those things are out there, and it really gets into digging into um, uh, what the, the cost payback would be for doing uh, uh, an energy upgrade project inside a facility, but also making sure that the staff, the people that are working there, are understanding what's going on and what the goals are and what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I'm going to circle back in a minute about how this links to energy audits because that's in a future webinar we want to do on energy audits and then making the energy efficiency improvements. But um, April, remind me of the numbers. It was something in the in terms of the energy that you've saved, something on the order of 20 percent. Is that right? Yeah, uh, overall 22 percent reduction in, in our buildings. And then, of course, I have each building identified if it had an energy project. Uh, as you can see on that third slide down, you can see that uh, significant reduction in kilowatt hour use uh, based on that information from the energy projects. But another way to get third party verification, um, I can't speak for other utilities. Um, I'm within the DTE realm and I am a trade ally with DTE. So I am able to go online and submit applications for energy efficiency projects which then get approved and we get a rebate check from the DTE uh, rebate system for doing these projects. Well, when you submit that application, the engineers at DTE go back and they, they'll they tell you, well, based on the information that we have, we believe that this is going to be your annual kilowatt hour reduction. So I'm able to take that information and after 12 months, verify whether or not we actually met or a lot of the times we exceed those goals of what they believe that we're going to reduce our energy use in. Uh, so that's a really good way of, of monitoring it. You know, again, it doesn't cost anything to participate in the DTE rebate program aside from capital dollars to do those energy projects. And that's just highlighting that, you know, each utility, you know, those, pro those programs might be different based on the utilities, but there are, you know, Utilities often have programs that allow you to that would fund kind of the efficiency improvements. It's a little That's, bit different yeah. when you when you are the utility, right, Bob? <laughs> uh, but the thing is that we still participate in energy efficiency programs like um, Efficiency United. So even ourselves, we we all pay in all of our facilities pay into those same programs too. So we would get access to rebates if we did projects in our buildings. We have utilized those to help us um, when we're trying to do the math to see if a project, uh, what the cost benefit analysis is and what the return on investment would be. Very good. If you, so um, if you're a community, like you both are with multiple facilities, right? You can, it's a similar effort I would imagine, or you can correct me if I'm wrong to like go out and find the meters link them to your bills, right? Um, and effectively start the spreadsheet. How do you use that information to decide which to move on and do energy audits with, or um, you know, how to prioritize effectively? Did, did that come into play at all um, in either of your communities? I guess I can start, I mean, I know like, we really went after our water and wastewater systems first because we knew that they were the, the largest um, of our municipal um, uh, buildings that use the most energy. So um, we had some opportunities with some funding um, for some upgrades we we're doing through some world development projects. So we're like, well, let's dig in here deeper and see are there things we could do that could not just enhance um, work within our system, but that could make this building a more efficient building. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure we are keeping costs in line associated with this too, but 
Um, it started out with just taking a look at like the biggest users that we had, but we've actually gone through and done audits with all of our facilities. Um, typically, it's not uncommon for municipal facilities to be some of the biggest energy hogs in the community just because they're the amount of use they get, the type of activities that are going on there. So those also tend to also be, I found anyway, to be uh, some of the biggest opportunities because people have been doing something the same way there for 50 years. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's being done the right way. And because sometimes, and this is not unique just to our community, but um, those facilities have been in place for a long time and maybe the investments haven't been there to keep up with some of the advances we've had in technology since that, you know, over that same period of time. So, and we're all facing fiscal pressures too. So a lot of this has been a great way for us to, to, help, back, to help push back on our bottom line. So we haven't had to make it as severe of cuts over the years that, we, that maybe some other communities have had to because we've kind of dug into some of these things. And April, you have over a hundred meters. I'm a, based just reading your spreadsheet, it seems like you don't apply effectively the same treatment to all of them in terms of which ones you're auditing actively. Is that true? Like, Well, for every utility bill that comes in, I'm entering it into that spreadsheet, comparing it to a 10 year average and making sure that there's absolutely no anomalies happening at those with those particular meters uh, but you know part of our our energy goal when when i first started at the county uh, we had gotten a grant uh, an eecgb grant uh, to do a bunch of projects and one of the first things that we tackled were outdoor lighting and we were then able to see at the facilities that we did those projects at the impact that it had on energy and again going uh, kind of back to what bob said if we didn't see those reductions in energy use, we'd go back and audit and try and figure out why, walk through the building and see if there's something different. Uh, did sudden uh, a sale on mini fridges go crazy and next thing you know everybody has a mini fridge or an unauthorized space heater, um, or you walk into a facility and you've done this great lighting project and you made everything uh, as energy efficient as possible, but there's still no reductions in it. Is that because maybe a timer wasn't working, an occupancy sensor wasn't working? Uh, so we walked through and we audited our buildings, just physically walked through um, on as, as often as we possibly can uh, to ensure that those things that we did put in place are functioning correctly. And benchmarking helps you with that. Uh, if, if you've done this project and you're expected to reduce your energy load by 20%, but it increases to five or 10%, you need to go back and figure out why that happened, what happened. Uh, that's sort of the, the fun part about energy auditing is the detective work that goes into it to try and discover things that uh, maybe you didn't know existed. Four of our buildings are over 100 years old, so we're constantly finding surprises behind walls and, and around corners that you just you didn't realize this particular thing is there. I think this actually leads nicely. There's another question from the audience about how you, as some communities are looking at electrifying fleets or um, adding other, you know, putting other things, uh, uh, electrifying other elements of their buildings. How are you tracking that? How do you work that into benchmarking? Because you would expect then your energy, you know, your energy consumption to increase, or your electricity consumption at least to increase. So. I guess this is kind of more of a nuts and bolts question. How, how do your spreadsheets work for that, or, or how are you all thinking about that? Well, we know that if, as we move forward, and 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 especially in the transportation piece, and and there more electric vehicles become part of of our reality, that there's going to probably be increases in in energy consumption from that 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 direction. Um, I, we have an electric. Uh, vehicle car charging station downtown here. Um, not a lot of people in the community have electric vehicles, but it's kind of like the 19 teens and gas stations. I mean, if you don't have a, a facility available for people, they're not going to come and visit your area if they can't charge their vehicle, right? So that's kind of the reason why we put ours in there. But um, we do we do take a look at the use of that station and what's going on there. Um, uh, we, we actually do get a fair amount of visitors. We were actually kind of surprised by that. We weren't sure exactly how many we would have. It was kind of a grant-funded project that the DDA kicked in some money on, and, 
and and we help help get in place. But um, that's kind of something that's going to be out there in the future as we continue to find new ways to do things we used to do a different way. Um, uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on that and see what impacts that have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. I we're we're going to have to work on it with our spreadsheets, you know, and we're going to have to keep an eye on it. I, I don't know. To be determined. What I hear is to be determined. And Lance, April, do you have any? Do you have EV chargers on any of your facilities? And how have you dealt with that on your as you're thinking about benchmarking? Uh, well, we've only got uh, two electric vehicle charging stations, and those are used primarily for county-owned vehicles. Uh, we're in discussion right now about potentially continuing to add to that fleet and infrastructure. Uh, we have done uh, in the beginning when we bought our first EV charger, we were provided reports, monthly reports for how long the car was plugged in for, how much electricity it used. So then we were able to say, well, it would have used this much gas per mileage for a traditional vehicle to kind of manage and monitor your fleet. Uh, but we haven't really taken off with it. Uh, I do new employee orientation uh, with every new employee that comes to the county. And if any employee works in the downtown Ann Arbor area and parks in one of the, I believe there's seven parking structures that have electric vehicle charging stations that are included in your price of entry. Uh, so that tends to try and encourage people. But in the eight years that I've been doing this orientation, I've had one person raise their hand and say, yeah, that's me. Uh, so we haven't really found that that trend is catching on, but we know what it would cost and what the environmental impact is per electric vehicle based on our how our drivers and operators are using those particular vehicles. Uh, but as far as electrification, we do have experience uh, with adding these electric heat units uh, to our facilities. It's rather new technology. Uh, so we were able to trend that because we benchmarked it since the beginning. We had five years of information before, and now we have five in, five years of information after. We're able to take the information that we benchmarked and said, well, if we were to convert this building that uses this many BTUs of gas annually over to electric, what would that look like? And if if we were to actually have enough money to do that, our carbon footprint would soar through the roof just because of the difference in what's coming out of our energy grid. Because we're, we're getting 3,412 BTUs out of a kilowatt hour of electricity, but we're getting 102,000 BTUs out of that one CCF of natural gas. So until the utility can make a swing on how they're providing our electricity through the traditional grid, uh, we're playing that balancing act right now. You know, do you replace these natural gas burning equipment with electricity? But I can go back and quantify that and say, well, this would be the environmental impact today if we did this today. And this would be the approximate cost for each of these facilities to be converted, uh, which is an incredibly ridiculous number right now. Uh, so if you're thinking about going for all electrification, Keep in mind that you're doing a disservice to the environment if you're in the DTE area where you're only getting 14 to 15% of your energy from renewable. And so, well, so what I'm hearing to translate, and you could tell me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, the, you know, on your spreadsheet, you can track like, well, we put in a whole bunch of additional electric load, <laughs> right? And in this building or, you know, on this meter at this time. So we would expect that there's going to be a spike in electricity use after that. What I also heard you say was when you're thinking about benchmarking, not just to get a grapple on the emissions associated with the electricity sector, but when you're thinking about it for, you know, sector community-wide, right? If you're also thinking about emissions associated with natural gas or with the, um, with the you know, uh, combustion engine vehicles that are driving around in your community, it gets, there needs to be talking between these because you would expect that there's going to be some um, movement from one kind of one spreadsheet to another. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, also, also and it's going to change over time too as the as the electric grid, the mix in the electric grid changes. Um, I know that that there's a lot of discussion about that generally, and and kind of 
which comes first, <laughs> you know, which, at what point where there's a, where's the crossover where, you know, um, a lot of the electrifying becomes cleaner, um, is the cleaner option. So. Yeah, absolutely. And as a facility manager, you need to be able to determine what change that's going to impact on your electric load. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for going all electric in facilities, as long as you can backfill it with renewables. But there again, you're going to need that benchmark baseline information to know how big of a solar array you're going to need to power your building. If you make it too big, you could essentially in the DTE land roll over a gen, just a ginormous credit that you'll never be able to use up. But then again, if you make it too small, then you're still not really helping the environment as much as you could if it was appropriately sized. And that's where that utility data information in multiple years of trending helps to guide those decisions on what your next energy efficiency project should be. Right. In, even with our community uh, solar project that we ended up doing, um, benchmark is a big part of that to make sure, we, make sure we, we write, we build something that's the right size for our community, something that, that we could uh, uh, build in such a way that we would get the right type of, uh, uh, you don't want to end up building something that's too big that nobody is going to be utilizing at the same time. You want to make sure that you're making something that you can uh, make a predictable and, and good investment. And um, that's one of the things I'm very proud of with that, that project. Not only were we able to um, build financing options associated with that for all the different rate classes, whether they were low or moderate income or, 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 or wealthy people, but we were able to um, uh, uh, not end up with something that, that uh, didn't fit the needs of our community. So we built something right sized. We worked with our local university and trying to model that out. And we were actually able to sell every single one of those panels, which was fantastic. That is great. Well, and again, highlights how all of these things kind of run into each other, right? It, this is kind of the first step in a right. full kind of community energy management program. Um, I have two more questions for each of you, um, and I'll, we'll just take them in turn. The first one is, can you tell us, because uh, can you tell us about any hiccups that you encountered um, and effectively how you overcame it? Like what, what was hard? What was harder in benchmarking than you thought? And, but effectively, like how, how did you overcome it and might, you know, you save some other communities some heartburn? Um, I don't know who wants to start. Yeah, that's Bob a tricky no problem. There's, there's, there's so many of them, and I, I don't want to throw um, any any particular utility under the bus, but um, Washtenaw County, uh, we buy our gas on the natural, the natural gas on the choice program. And the utility, the, the provider, the choice provider that we used uh, did not provide meter reads on the utility bill. And all of a sudden, during the polar vortex, our natural gas shot up. Uh, it was incredibly high, the, the usage for a particular building. And when we had the conversation with the choice provider, uh, they had said nobody had ever asked for meter reads before because I wanted to be able to compare it. Uh, and then I was told that the meter had been read incorrectly for 10 years. So this kind of came as a big surprise. Now all of a sudden, we're going to have this, uh, how, how are we going to budget for this? All of a sudden, this, this uh, was like a 50% increase in natural gas that how are we going to manage this? Well, as it turned out that that was not the case, that the meter was being correctly read, but that particular month or those three months when natural gas was at its highest, because we're on the choice program without a locked in rate, our gas was triple of what we would have paid for DTE. So having that information led me back to the meter once I was able to get the information to be able to read the meter, disprove what they were telling me about those three particular months. And then I was able to go back with five years of solid data to, and we ended up with a refund based on what we overpaid for each of those individual months. So some of it's getting good data from the utility, um, depending absolutely. on what you are. Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick follow-up before I ask Bob and to buy him a little time in case he wants to share what his hiccup was. Do you have any sense, April, of like, uh, and this is another question that came in, what the, the, save, the money that you've saved, either from that refund, right? Um, that was really a correction, 
or any of these other programs what you're using what what's how that how those mo saved monies are used in washington county is it towards en other energy projects is it just put it kind of like savings on the general fund how does that work well that money then rolls back into our operations budget uh, we are working on a plan right now to get a certain percentage of our utility savings back into the energy fund. Uh, but for now, uh, we are actually funding a $2.5 million interior LED lighting project uh, by getting budget dollars in the future and then paying that back with the energy savings, uh, which then gives us a budget neutral capital project that's going to after six years pay for itself along with those additional dollars of reduction uh, but the way that our budget system works right now if we are short funded in in one particular area of our budget those savings have been actually going to cover those um, dollars that weren't there uh, so those dollars are actually going to kind of fund other areas of our infrastructure, uh, which is great because we're able to continue to support, uh, but moving forward in the future, those dollars and energy savings are going to roll back and pay for a future project. Great. Bob, any thoughts on hiccups and how to overcome them? Or if you want to tell us kind of what you do with your energy savings dollars that you found through benchmarking? Or well, Part of our energy savings dollars, like especially in those given departments, like in our enterprise funds, like water and sewer, and well, even in electricity too, if we're able to save dollars for the particular utilities that we have, those dollars take the pressure off of rates we have going out in the future for people. They've also helped us um, be able to make some more investments. So maybe instead of just doing one section of town of LED lighting in a particular year, we'd be able to add an extra section because we had some savings for there that we weren't anticipating but also some of these things will, um as you think some of these things go back to some operational things too so maybe that helped us keep some extra money into the park system that otherwise might have been um uh something that might have been up for grabs because uh we we had received cuts in revenue sharing over a particular period of time and so that's helped keep those things uh, at a level where the at a, where the community has expected those things to be so far as some of the hiccups I run into, though, a lot of them were more so things that, like, no matter how we modeled it or whatever, like, someone did something. We were talking about the detective work where, like, you get into something, you're like, what is going on here? Like, there's this did not work out the way we thought it was going to work out. Um, and, and it's actually helped us figure out some things um, that I think actually, in the end, made, made our operations not only better, but obviously we were able to achieve those savings eventually. But... Um, it's, it's helped, I think, people better understand um, operationally within what we're doing here, um, what the goals were, and, um, and, and to think a little bit more about what they're doing and not just, not just doing what they've done because that's what we did, you know, going back 40 or 50 years ago. Great. So. Well, and to the extent that that's behavioral, right, like there's the idea we, that kind of what you do at work maybe carries over into your home, too, and so they can save some money at home. So. Um, great. Um, is there any closing words in terms of advice that you want to give to communities who haven't done any kind of benchmarking in the past before I turn it over to Julie to tell other communities about how to get funding for these kind of activities? Closing words of advice. I think that this stuff can build into things. So like I said, like we did the pilot project at our water plant with our solar project and it turned into this really awesome community conversation which led into our community solar project in partnerships with Michigan Tech and, and other people to help um, to help get something like that done. And, you know, in partnerships with the Eagle, I and mean, they helped us out with our low moderate income programs. Now there are 25 families here that are seeing some significant um, reductions in their energy bills, um, not just because of the benefit of the renewables that they have access to now, but also part of that program we were able to roll in um, uh, getting us weatherization done in their homes. So those are now dollars that those families have that they can put back into um, their, their own families and, and making opportunities happen for their kids. And maybe uh, before would have just been going straight to a utility bill. So lots of cool things can happen. You don't really know where the journey might lead you, but um, I think for us in general, it's all been pretty positive, so. Great. April, any closing words of wisdom? 
Um, yeah, the effort's worth the reward. Uh, tracking and balancing all this information is extremely painful, uh, but I have demonstrated over the last eight years, not only can I pay for my salary, but the person sitting next to me's salary as well and these energy savings that we've had. And let's face it, the cost of utilities are gonna continue to increase and if you don't have control over it, you're gonna be spending more money than you should. Uh, so it's, it's equitable, it's viable, it makes sense to track that information. You'll be surprised at the results that you find. Uh, before I came along, the, the county didn't really have anybody that was scrutinizing the utility bills as closely as I have. So when they received a bill, they would just pay it, whether they understood it or not, or whether the amount was right, or whether the building was on the right rate. Um, so these things are gonna save your community money, it's gonna save your organization money, and it's possible that maybe someday this might be mandated information, and if you have it ready to go, you're gonna look like a rock star. <laughs> well, that's... One more, sorry, one more thing too, like, like something like this, uh, it led to, it's helped us build a roadmap of like figuring out what we've got going on out there. Where are our opportunities? I mean, there are places we can be making investments that can be making a significant impact on our operations. Unless you did some benchmarking and dug into these things, had some audits done, you wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, with that, um, knowing that benchmarking may be the beginning of being a rock star and doing amazing other things in your community, um, including community solar in the UP. Um, I want to thank you both and turn it over to Julie to kind of give, um, tell us more about the funding that's available or will soon be available for communities who want to start on this. Yeah, thanks Bob and April. That was a great presentation. Glad um, everything is going so well. Thanks Sarah. So hi everyone, my name is Julie Saveland. I work in the sustainability section within EGLE and you may have heard about our community energy management incentive program. We have um, a whole presentation of this, uh, that we recorded from our last webinar. So that's gonna be on our website soon. But essentially what this program is, is it's designed to meet communities wherever you are at in the energy management spectrum. So whether that's at the beginning with benchmarking or energy audits, or you're ready for some of those energy efficiency upgrades, or you've already done all your upgrades and now you're ready to take that step to renewable energy, um, we kind of meet you where you're at. So um, Sarah, if you wanna go to the next slide. So this program is gonna be opening up next week. Um, there's not a match requirement because we know, like the only way to move the needle is to put money in. And we know that not everybody has funding available to work on some of these projects. So we're trying to help grantees meet those goals and meet those projects. So there's no match required. Right now the um, amount is about 15,000 per community. We're targeting communities that we haven't worked with before, um, but again it kind of comes into demand for some for serve um, and then we're going to be wrapping up these projects in the summer of next year. So if you're interested or um, you know you have any questions, you're not sure where to start, please feel free to contact me at any time. My number or my uh, email is on the screen. You can also come to our website too. We've got a bunch of resources on there, um, fact, fact sheets, case studies, um, future webinars, um, a bunch of other resources, and we're happy to help wherever you need us. So hopefully we'll hear from you soon. Thanks, Julie. And I just thought I would wrap up. Uh, Julie mentioned that there's upcoming webinars and trainings that you can find online. And so that's the URL is again at the bottom of the um, screen here. Um, the next webinar in this series will be on energy audits. We're trying to nail down a date, but hopefully it'll be in early November. Um, mentioning that uh, we're also expecting um, to have a training as part of the Catalyst Communities Program. Um, there's a, a workshop going on with Ann Arbor on energy codes. And then in December, um, hopefully uh, another webinar on financing energy efficiency improvements. And I also wanted to mention that um, there's a follow-up meeting about energy benchmarking and data access that the Detroit Green Task Force and EcoWorks are putting on. On the exit survey um, from this webinar, if you're interested in being part of that or learning more, feel free to leave your information there. Um, and once that data set, 
um, we can communicate that out with you. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and we welcome any feedback that you have, what kind of uh, um, content you'd like to see in future webinars, or what it is that we can do to help your community as it thinks about policies and programs that move towards clean energy. So thank you very much and have a great day.